<laughs> okay. Uh, I'm very pleased we've got several panelists who's going to share their experiences with us. Those are uh, Julie Pritilak, uh, Durham, Kevin Murphy from the Mineralogical Society, uh, Hannah Jurakova from St Andrews, and David Wilson at UCL. I'll stop sharing now. Hello, everyone. Um, so, first off, I uh, I wondered if each of you could just give us a bit more of an introduction to yourselves and your involvement uh, in the peer review process. Start wherever, or I can pick somebody. Uh, we'll start with Kevin then, please. Okay, Th thanks. Hi, Kevin Murphy, as you said, from the MINSOC. Um, I, I don't review papers, <laughs> but, but we are involved in the process of publishing them and we have two journals and I thought it would be useful to come along today and offer a publisher perspective on, on the process uh, which tends to be a bit more of a, a holistic view of, of a thing from from submission right through to publication. Great thanks uh, Julie. Hello I remember submitting papers way back when I was a PhD student and how daunting that was so I think this is a, a great thing to do. I currently am an editor for Geochemica Cosmochemica Acta since 2019. I'm also an editor for Geostandards and Geoanalytical Research since 2013. I sit on the editorial advisory board for a Journal of Petrology since 2019. So I think I can give a, a perspective on some of the editorial processes and maybe shed a little light into what happens when your paper gets submitted and then what the review process is like and how to uh, best practice in terms of responding to reviews uh, to help the editors realize that you've responded to reviews correctly. Great. Hannah? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm um, still maybe as a slightly early stage. I'm an early career researcher, so it might be useful um, if I can get some kind of insights from, from this end. I've reviewed um, a whole bunch of manuscripts for kind of most important um, most of the important board, um, broad and disciplinary journals in our field. Um, and the uh, part of the editorial board member for paleogeography, paleoclimatology, and paleoncology, as well as um, global and planetary change. And I'm currently also one of the associate um, editors for a special issue on boron isotopes. That call has just been open in paleo oceanography and paleoclimatology. So maybe I can um, provide some insights from, from this end. Lovely, David. Hi, hi everyone. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a lecturer at UCL, and I guess I'm also sort of similar, similar to Hannah. I'm not um, kind of editing journals at the moment, but I've reviewed rather a lot of um, papers in my time so far as a as a researcher, and I've seen a lot of reviews of my own papers and co-authors' papers. And um, so I think hopefully I have some good um, perspectives to put on um, how to make life easy for your co-authors, how to make life easy for reviewers. Um, who are, you know, when you're revising papers, these kinds of things. So hopefully it'll be a really interesting uh, session. I'm sure it will be. Thanks, everyone. Um, OK, so to get started then, a bit more of a general question. Uh, how do you get involved in peer reviewing and how experienced do you need to be in order to, to do that? So again, I can pick on people. I mean, I can start so. if you like. Um, sure. So, so I mean, I first started peer reviewing basically when I finished my PhD. Um, and the first person that asked me to peer review a paper was my um, external examiner, um, who obviously had seen you know, what I'd worked on, thought I had some vague degree of competence and knew that I'd be a good target to start reviewing things. So that was basically where it kicked off. Um, and then, of course, subsequent to that, um, it was sort of a case of when you're working on certain topics, then you're known in those fields, you know people at conferences, they're editors of, of, of papers, so it kind of kicks on from there really. So yeah, I'd say in my case it was as soon as I finished my PhD, so during the time I was doing a postdoc, I was reviewing quite a few papers basically, um, and and then it becomes like, it becomes the, you know, the topics you work on, you end up being asked to review papers because you're, uh, perhaps because you're being cited by the authors, for example. I can hey. maybe go. Um, yeah, I can oh. totally relate to that. I guess it's been quite similar for me. Maybe I can only um, add that I've started to review 
slightly bit earlier um kind of another possibility is that your your supervisor um kind of ask has a paper that you know is very relevant to what you're just working on and there's actually a possibility to kind of obviously he or she gets asked um to do the review but can involve a student and that's something you can also discuss with the editor and that way you know kind of I was guided by my supervisor at the time to to provide um insight and kind of explain me about the review process and then we kind of together I guess submitted the 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 the, the you know the review back to the journal and then the 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 path has been very similar to me for me as David was saying yeah so I, I very much agree with those guys um I started to review right after my PhD as well one of the ways that editors find new reviewers is uh usually when we send out a request to a reviewer if it's a, a leader of a group we often have a tagline on there saying, if you know of any people in your group that would be uh, have the relevant expertise, we also would like them as a, as a suggestion. Because until you're in the system of the, the lists for each journal, you don't automatically come up. So once you're in there, then you start to get a lot more requests. So it generally snowballs. Uh, once you start to review one paper, particularly if you've done a, a very helpful reviewer, a very helpful review, the editor will go, ah, oh, this person, actually did a really thorough job. I'm going to try them again. I'm going to try them again. So the caution I would say is if it snowballs out of control, you know, don't, don't be reviewing, don't take on three papers at a time um, to, to do it properly. And in a way that you find useful as well, you don't want to overload yourself. So it's very exciting to get involved in it, but temper the enthusiasm at the beginning until you get into a, a routine. Uh, reviewing gets easier the more you do it, like, like everything does. Yeah, I, I would agree with, with the comments so far as well. I, I would add, actually, that from a publisher perspective, we encourage potential reviewers to reg the, register themselves on our journal's databases. So a, a young career, a young researcher, an early career researcher can go in to Mineralogical Magazine um, and, and give their details, but also specify the areas of, of research that they're interested in and feel capable of reviewing. And that really helps an associate editor who does not know them personally, but who can who can find them in the database and say, oh, that's their area of expertise. I, I can go and pick them or invite them. So, so you know, the serendipitous approach works to, to a large extent where you, you, you get discovered, so to speak, because you've published something yourself. But but ECRs can be proactive in this regard. And I think it's it's really helpful to us as publishers if they if they do that. But if if I may just add one thing, for every paper that's reviewed, we need three reviewers, obviously. Um, so everybody who wants to publish a paper in their heads ought to be thinking, I should try and review three papers in order to allow the the system to uh, to stay alive for it to be sustainable. So one, so that's really good advice of kind of registering yourself at a, a journal because that's one of the questions one of the, with a publisher because that's one of the questions that we got sent in ahead is, um, you know, how can ECRs find opportunities for peer review? So registering at the publisher as a as a potential reviewer. Yes, certainly. Or sim simply sending an email to the editor also works. Okay, excellent. Um, and um, Julie, you did say there about making sure that requests don't snowball and that you can kind of keep on top of that workload. Um, so aside from time constraints, how do you decide whether or not to review a paper? If there are no time constraints and it's a topic that I'm interested in, then my default would be yes. It also depends on the journal so some it, it's a little bit different reviewing let's say a geochemical perspectives letter paper that's going to be four pages versus a 50 page journal of petrology paper so it, it's also about familiarity with the with the format of the journal that you're being asked to review for there are also different types of i will probably get into this later but there's different types of reviews depending on the journal some are blind some are not blind so when you're deciding whether or not to take on a review, have a look at the journal as well and what they require. A lot of times they'll give you a very short deadline saying, you know, we're going to require your review in two weeks. You can always, there's always a little bit of leeway with this, um, but weighing up whether to review a paper is the balance between what that journal requires from you in terms of your time and your interest. I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't review something you're not interested in. Likewise, if you're able to review an aspect of the paper, but are not a complete a expert in all of it, that's still really valid. A lot of the papers that we have now are, are multidisciplinary. So if you're not comfortable with one part of it, let's say you're an isotope geochemist like me, and part of it is isotopes and part of it is some crazy numerical modeling, you can still take on that paper and say, I have the expertise to evaluate what they've done with the data and how they've done this, but I don't have the expertise in that. And it's absolutely fine to say that. Um, as long as you make that clear to the editor, that's no problem. So I wouldn't um, not take on a paper because you're not comfortable with every single aspect of it. It's gonna be rare that you have the situation where you're comfortable with every single aspect of a paper that you're, you're reviewing. As long as you're transparent about that, it really helps the editor. Great, thing. I did see a lot of nodding during that. Has anyone else got anything to add? We'll come back to the kind of time commitment that it, um, that it requires, but anyone got anything further? I would add one one point. I, the key point that I was going to make was the one that Julie just made about, you know, be, be very clear about what you're able to cover. Um, because because if you don't say anything about the stuff that you can cover, the editor will assume you're happy with it. Um, so, so, so it's really important. The other thing in terms of choice, and I wear a Minsock hat here, is in terms of the publisher, maybe you'd care to look at, does that, does that, journal does that society put something back into the community or not because you know if, if your community benefits from the publisher it might be one that you choose to support in terms of providing a review to them okay i was just gonna add one thing which is that in the first instance you know if you're maybe a phd student or you know reviewing the first paper or two you probably want to take on something which is a review in an area that's pretty close to what you've been working on what you feel you're an expert on um, because A, you'll feel qualified to do it, and B, you'll know the papers they're referring to, and it will make your life a bit easier. Um, so don't feel you know that you have to jump at the first chance. I would wait until you're getting requests to review something that's quite close to your exp expertise. Um, whereas later on, you might actually be, well, you know, I've, I've reviewed enough things on you know, my own field, and I'm, I know what I'm doing by now, and I can take on more, slightly more interdisciplinary type papers, or something that's a bit further from your natural comfort zone, because you think it's interesting and might be important so i think what you might agree to review could probably change slightly through your if you like stages of your career as well okay okay so back to a bit more of a generalist question how do you start working on a review and what's your process for reviewing a paper let's start with hannah right i think um well, the way I start normally is I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll think about all these questions, whether I, I accept the review and, you know, if I can can review it. And then once I've accepted, I would probably just read through that paper straight away because I'm just very kind of excited about it and, you know, just looking forward. Also want to gauge kind of how much work that's going to be or not to be and kind of be able to think about that. And then I'll potentially, depending, you know, again, how much of a work, how much of a, you know, what format that is, kind of walk away and come back to it in the next um, few days, maybe uh, the next week, and kind of have my day dedicated or afternoon, really, um, to to kind of work on that. And that's when I work on that. And I think that's very helpful, because you kind of read through it, and, and you have the time to, to think about it. And then, you know, um, kind of, um, yeah, um, before you actually get to it, right. And then, um, in general, um, the 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 kind of most useful format I find is that you wanna you wanna somehow start with a summary. You wanna kind of summarize what you've read. I think that's very useful for editors to understand, like for them to know that you know you've understood what the paper is, and also kind of see what you actually get out of it. Um, one thing is maybe what the authors claim, and the other thing is what actually is kind of said there. So you make a little summary, and then um, kind of. You lay out um, at the very start, maybe, you know, in the next few kind of couple of paragraphs, um, kind of what you what you what you've taken out from that. Um, you you, you want to provide some sort of a take home messages, I think, for the editors, you give your kind of overall impression of the paper. And then um, I would write normally a couple of more paragraphs or, you know, three or a few more um, kind of 
highlighting the the evidence that I have um kind of and the the to to support my overall conclusion and then you get to your um kind of separating major um from minor um um kind of um comments and then you have very detailed um points um kind of very specific um at the at the end um one thing that's very important is always you want to refer to the to the line to the specific figures to the specific paragraph and um um yeah just you know make sure you think about that you're writing to the editor especially kind of the very first part few paragraphs you want to be very clear about that like you know that this is the message to that this is the message i want to convey and then obviously make suggestions to to the um reviewers uh authors thank you anyone else want to talk through their process uh i can go if you like sure so yeah, the only thing I, I suspect this is different from a lot of people, maybe. So don't necessarily do what I do. Um, but when I've normally, if I obviously once I've you know, agreed to review it, I've maybe read the abstract, I've maybe flicked through the figures just to see roughly what the theme is, roughly what the topic is. But I'll tend to read it through and actually make comment, like scribble, I'll print it out. So these days we don't print many things, but if I'm reviewing something, I'll print it out and, and I'll read it through and I'll scribble comments as I go the first time through. Um, and I think that's not what necessarily everyone does. Um, but I think it's helpful in a way because it's like that's what most readers will get is that one time through reading and their first impression. So I'll kind of note things that don't make sense or um, bits I like, bits that I don't like. So I'll actually go through in quite a lot of detail the first time around. Um, and then as, as Hannah said, you know, you'll come back to it over a course of days. So I wouldn't ever do a review in one day. I'll come back to it two or three times and read it probably three times. Um, and the second time I'll come through um, and read it and take the take my comments put them into into a text file and kind of work on them think about them follow up on things i said you know i need to check this and what's this reference and what's going on here and i'll do that detailed work second time around but i've already put a lot of my thoughts and impressions first time around and then probably a third time around once i've got that together i'll reread the paper again but kind of quickly or properly as though i'm i'm a reader to check it matches with what i've written in my review in terms of recommendations and my views and my you know, what I think with the strengths and things. So I think it's like a multi-step thing in my case. Um, and yeah, the only, and yeah, I mean, you described nicely how I like the different maybe parts within what the review would look like. Um, I would probably say that first paragraph I'm writing to like a read, trying to write a clear summary to the editor to say, this is what they're claiming. This is what they've measured. Maybe even the number of samples they've measured from where, what do they say it means? What do I think it means? And do I agree with them? Do I think it's important? Do I think it's interesting? So that first paragraph, I think, is really to the editor. But it's also a good way of telling the authors that this is what I've made of your paper. And if, if they if they agree with that, they'll think, well, you've understood my paper and they'll follow through on your recommendations below. So I think that's quite an important paragraph where it's like the big high level um, aspects about the paper. And then, of course, you follow through with, you know, with all the details, um, as you mentioned. I guess I do a, a somewhere in between the two of you guys. I print the figures. I don't print the whole thing. A lot of times you'll see when you get something to review, all the figures are at the end. Uh, it's not every journal now, but a lot of times that's the case. And you'll find it's very annoying to flip between text and figures. And I like having the figures in color. So I just generally print out the figures. So as I'm reading the text, I can really focus on those. It's like when you start learning how to read scientific papers the first time, you should, like we've been saying, read the abstract, look at the figures. You're not going to go into the details of the text until you're sure that's a paper you want to read. And you can apply that to when you're reviewing. If the figures don't match the text right away, you've got a problem. And if the figures don't tell the story in a way that they should, you've got a problem. If you think of when someone reads an article that's published, those, those visual items are actually really important along, along with the abstract. And um, in, all, in all the editing I do, I can't overemphasize the importance of that first paragraph that David and Hannah are talking about. One of the key things to do there as well, make sure that you, I would, I always like it when there's a recommendation at the end of that paragraph. You, don't be afraid to say what you recommend, okay? But make sure that that recommendation then matches the rest of the review. You'd be surprised how many times say, oh, you know, nice summary, minor revisions, and then just tons <laughs> of problems, right? And as an editor, it's really confusing. You're saying, well, you're, you're saying this is minor revisions, but you've got real issues with this, with this paper. 
if the first couple of times you review, you don't feel comfortable stamping out, you know, the first time I rejected a paper, I felt horrible. Now I feel less bad about it somehow sometimes, but um, that, that for, you know, it can be a hard thing to do. So then don't put a recommendation if you're not going to follow through with it. Um, it has to match. It has to match. And I guess the other thing to always, always do is be respectful in your tone. There's nothing worse um, when you get reviews back and you've had a reviewer that's used insulting language, um, just belittling, condescending. It happens more than I'd like to admit. And part of our job as editors is to screen for that. And that does not always happen. Um, so please don't be part of the problem. You can, learning how to critique something in a constructive way is a, is a key skill to have. And you can completely disagree with something and think that they've got this completely wrong, but that doesn't mean that you have to be aggressive or insulting about it. If they've missed a key reference, ah, maybe you haven't seen, you know, you, you don't have to use language that, that um, is not helpful. So what I usually do with my reviews for their, their final pass, as David was saying is third time through, I actually check it for tone. I do a, a tone check on myself as the last one through. You know, if it's a subject you're passionate about and you think it's wrong and you're like, oh no, this is how it should be. It, it's, it's very natural to be perhaps overly enthusiastic in your disagreement, if, if that makes sense. So just do that final check for, for tone. Um, it'll save you and everyone else involved a lot of um, unnecessary stress really. Yeah, that's a great point, Julia. Was, actually, I, I didn't mention that, but I would, I would in that third check, I would always be like reading it as though I'm the author, and how would I respond? How would I feel getting that? And I'm quite. I mean, I, I, I'm. That's one thing I don't struggle with in reviewing is being kind of polite and constructive. But it is still. I often find that second to the third version fee, I've become a bit nicer, a bit more gentle. And the content of that doesn't change. So you're not you're not softening your review. You're you're making it more constructive in the way that you're telling them what the issues are. And you get a much better response that way as well. Imagine these are gonna be your colleagues. You're gonna see them in a conference. Whether or not you sign your name is a whole other issue I'm sure we'll talk about. But irrespective, um, you can get a, a reputation very quickly if you consistently um, misbehave in the tone of your reviews. Maybe if I can just quickly add to that, to totally agree. I mean, um, yeah, you. Imagine you are receiving these these comments, right? You, nobody wants to see that. That's just terrible. Um, but like, also, don't forget to add something positive. I think there's something positive to be found in every paper. And there's lots of papers I have seen that people review and they just go on about this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But there are so many things that are maybe exciting, novel, and 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 you know, positive. And and please include that as well. Don't just um, pick up every single flaw you can find to kind of comment on anything positive you, you find as well. And, and there is, there is for sure. That, that's, a, that's a great point. And I think this, this is the, the, root, um, the root cause of the disconnect we sometimes see between recommendation and further review. So someone might say minor corrections or minor revision. Um, and then there's all this negativity, but they probably liked a lot of the paper. They just didn't say it. They probably thought, oh, this is a great paper, but there's all these things that can make it better. And I'm just going to go to town on that, uh, but not without emphasizing again the why it's important and why the journal should take that paper. You know, why why should it be published is just as important as um, the issues that might be there to improve it. Yeah, and coming back to that first paragraph, I've sometimes sort of taken that approach of saying, look, this is this is really important. Basically, I think this should be published. This is a really exciting paper. Don't be put off by the fact there's lots of minor points below. Just to clarify for the editor that. Look, it looks like a long review, and it is because it's a GCA paper and it or, or whatever, and it's going to be a long paper, which necessarily means lots of minor and you know line by line comments. But don't don't let that put you off. That actually, I really want this to be. I think this is really should be published. If if I could add just a, a couple of points, and as I said at the outset, I don't review, and I think the comments that that uh, David, Julie, and Hannah have made are are, are excellent. Re really like them as as a publisher person. That's exactly the sort of people I want reviewing papers for our journals. Um, for, for somebody who's who's new to this game, I, I would suggest a couple of mechanical things that you can do at the outset, and that is to look at the structure of any submitted paper. Now, papers come in, in 
all sorts of shapes and sizes in terms of the journals and so on that they get submitted to. But in general, the structure ought to be the same. You have the same main subheadings for every single paper. So if you're a reviewer, I would, I would ask, why is this section missing if there's a section missing? Is everything in its appropriate place? Because you'll, you'll often find people putting conclusions into their data section. You'll, you'll find that, that something that's missing, obvious missing from the introduction, you mentioned a, a reference earlier. So once you've done that, you, you'll often find key gaps in, in the logic in terms of what people have done. And that's a good place to start in terms of finding things to say to the, to the authors. Um, Remember also that when you write a review, there is a set of comments that goes to the editor and it doesn't necessarily have to be the same as the set of comments that goes to the author. And one can sometimes afford to be a, a bit more direct when one is talking to the editor in terms of what you're trying to get across so that they're clear about what you're saying. But the business about being constructive and being polite and supportive is really important. And I think most journals nowadays uh, will insist on that of, the, of their reviewers. Um, and, and finally, one other point was was uh, the length of your review is 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 important. I mean, for me, the sorts of things that David mentioned at the outset, taking a manuscript and writing your comments on it, or Julie said, print out the figures, writing some comments on it. If you if you if you're willing to do it, scanning those things and uploading them as part of your review is hugely valuable to the authors as feedback. That stuff is really valuable. It in the days since we've gone to online only reviewing. Uh, we've lost a lot of that and actually I, I think that's uh, that's to our detriment because that really helps authors and and if you've got the time to do anything at all on language for for people who's for whom English isn't their first language it really helps also I mean we as publishers do a lot of that work post acceptance but if you can help with language or make suggestions or comments on your way through that's also really valuable can I just um pick up on that point there is um Oftentimes you might get an annotated PDF that a reviewer has done. They may have taken the PDF and, and written their comments in there. That's fine to do that, but it becomes very difficult for an editor to know the scale, the importance of the comments without some summary that goes with that. Yeah. So just submitting an annotated PDF alone is really hard for the editors. I, I, I use the same system as Hannah, actually. I have a summary, major comments, major science, minor science, editorial. And I could, I also sometimes submit an annotated PDF, but I, I save that more for editorial concerns or missing references or things like that. It's a lot better than having this long document of line by line, perhaps. But my point is, don't hide a major problem that you have with the paper in an annotated PDF, because it's a lot of work for the editor to go through that. What they want to do is they want to have your summary, know where you're at and compare that with the other reviews while, um, while they try to make a decision. The other comment just to pick up on there, um, if you have authors that, that there's serious problems with the English, this happens quite a bit, that the abstract will be well written and then the body of the paper less so. We, we see this quite a bit. If you're reviewing a paper and you, get and you start getting into it and the English is at a stage where, where it's, inhibiting you understanding the science, you're well within your right to go back to the editor to stop your review and say, look, um, the English was good in the introduction and the abstract, but it's, it's degraded now. Can you go back to the authors and get them to resubmit? Likewise, if a data set is missing, if they've plotted data and you don't have access to that data, this happens a lot as well. It's also best practice for, for submitting a paper. You know, we're geochemists, you know, our interpretations come and go, but data lives forever. If you can't replot their data and it's going to, you know, take you days and days to reconstruct this data set that they've used in a figure, go back to the editor and ask them to ask the Oscar authors for that data set. Don't don't spend your time spinning your wheels um, and trying to sort that out yourselves. That's a common yeah. request I get from reviewers is, is where's the data set. Typical. Uh point about, about most publishers and certainly us these days, Julie, is that we're, we're looking through the manuscript at uh, submission stage and, and we have that as the standard. If it, It's got to be understandable by the reviewers before we'll give it to, to an editor, an associate editor to farm out to reviewers. It, the, the problem comes in, I guess, when it, the first half is good and that's what gets yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> that, Fair I've enough. Seen that, seen that a couple of times, yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's quite a lot there. Um, 
all very useful and it touched on quite a quite a few of our questions and I just wanted to like repeat that quote from Julie just now that I think is amazing is interpretations come and go but data lives forever uh, I think that was very nice so um yeah so some of the things uh, questions that we have that, that have been touched on in that discussion is um what are some of the most important things to look out for as a reviewer um for instance should you check data sets and calculations so Julie, you certainly check that they're available. Do you ever do anything with them? Does anyone else kind of use the methods of uh, data analysis and re redo it to check or anything like that? It depends. It, it depends. There are some things uh, in your field that you'll know are correct. You'll see it and you're like, okay, that's about ballpark right. But if, if something doesn't feel right and you're not able to double check that becomes a problem so i wouldn't say that you have to redo every model calculation in a paper but if there's something that doesn't quite make sense you could well actually i should back up there a second as a new reviewer it might be useful for you to recreate the calculations to make sure you understand it that's something i did during my phd when i was reading papers and i still do do i understand what this calculation was um, so from that point of view uh, it can become useful to you to redo those calculations not with a view to seeing if they're right or not but just making sure that you understand all the parameters that are used. Um, again, it really, for me, it depends on what kind of calculation it is. I'm not going to set up a whole numerical model to redo someone's paper, but if uh, there's something that doesn't, just doesn't match what I expect, then I want to understand why my expectation is wrong or if there's a parameter problem. Yeah, okay. go on, okay. okay. Go, go, sorry. I could. No. All right, I'll choose uh, David. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say that similar to Julie, that it's like, I don't think, and I mean, I might be wrong here, that it's our job to check absolutely everything that someone's done in the paper, right? Because that's, that may have taken, you know, weeks and months, and I don't think you can do that. Um, but if something either looks a bit odd, then I'll try and, you know, play around with the calculation, see if I can recreate it. Um, and I'll probably take a look at, data check that when someone's describing data in the text so that the numbers actually match what they show in a graph for example that's a common error that you'll spot where the two don't actually match up either because it's a different version or they just got the units wrong or something um or if a data set doesn't look so i will check to see that the data were there and that i could reproduce it i'll probably plot up you know a rare earth element spider diagram or a, some kind of time series if i want to play a bit with their data so i would use it as a useful tool i would definitely make sure that the data is available like in an Excel file or something so that you can have a play with it. But I don't think it's realistic for us as reviewers to sort of routinely go through and check, you know, calculation, you know, sort of line by line by line. But it's useful to play with it sometimes. Hannah? Oh, I can only second that. Yeah, I pay okay. a lot of um, attention to to reproducibility, I guess, um, to kind of further comment on that. I think, you know, obviously, um, um, you know, you want to assess the technical details. That's your, really your job as a reviewer. Um, but one thing um, I like to focus on a lot is it's reproducible. You'll be surprised how many times. Um, and sometimes it's just kind of this very innocent mistake. But like, you know, people forget to add some information and then suddenly like the whole experiment, that, that analysis couldn't be reproduced. And that obviously... Um, makes the data um kind of not as timeless and uh, you know um as as you would think so so that that's very important it's very important that that people can go and reproduce the experiment come up with the you know if if the interpretations are 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 wrong then you know these are the interpretations the authors are giving to to their data but at least that that whole kind of um conclusion of the of the you know of the manuscript that's based on the issue you should be able to 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 do that experiment for example and and see what you get yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with Hannah and, and David there. It, it is our job to check the data quality. And there are some simple things you can do, make sure standards are reported, blanks, how are their errors reported? So when you're reviewing geochemical data, there are some very basic thresholds that need to be met um, for, for data reporting. If it's a bunch of isotope data without any reference materials, without how they standardize their data, without a protocol for the mass spectrometry, it, it just doesn't give you confidence in the rest of the paper. And we, we have so many things published now. We've got a proliferation of, of geochemical data out there and we need it to be the best quality it can. I, I, would, I would argue that's 
probably one of the most important things as a reviewer is to check that the data quality makes sense. So they may have reported a bunch of reference materials. Well, does it match previous studies? If they haven't compared it with previous studies, how do you know? And that's where it is worth doing a little bit of digging um, to find out there are, you know, in geochemical specialist journals, there are clear quality thresholds that need to be met. Some are more stringent than others. Um, for geostandards and geoanalytical research, I mean, the way that you even write your data is very, very controlled and probably quite alien to, to those that haven't published in that journal. So as you're, as you're submitting work as well, make sure that you meet those thresholds in everything you submit. Um, I think it's, it's just absolutely key that your, data, that your data hold up demonstrably. Report errors that are realistic, even if they're a little bit bigger than other people's errors, those are your errors. Don't, uh, don't make plots with a two standard error in one data set and two SD in another data set. That's always a favorite. You know, there are little tricks that people do. But yes, data quality control is, is a primary job of the reviewer. Okay. Um, so the penultimate question before we go over to response to peer review, um, this might be slightly a, a quick answer, I'm not sure, but we've talked a, a bunch about different journals having different expectations um do you get given guidance for from the the journals for what they expect from review or what's the difference between reviewing for interdisciplinary versus um non interdisciplinary like gta or something like that um something a bit more specific like that is there is there guidance that's uh, journal specific that you get given when you are approached to review something Depends on the journal, really depends on the journal. Um, GCA, there's no specific guidance given, um, but I know reviewing for more broad journals like Nature, Science, Nature Communications, that family of journals will ask, you know, is this a step forward? Justify that it is, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, it really is journal specific from my reviewing experience. Bunch of nodding. I think I think most journals look for novelty, as Julie just said, but but it's it's not pulled out specifically in the request to the reviewer. Okay, I think in most cases you can tend to find some kind of advice for reviewers from a particular journal, um, but that does evolve through time a bit, and whether they give you some check boxes to tick or whether they ask you for a report only can vary from journal to journal. Um, so I think. I think part of it is from what you can find on the website about a particular journal, or maybe part of it is from your own experience of what do you, what's your expectation in a GS standards paper, what's your expectation in a GCA paper, and then sort of what's your expectation in something like EPSL, which is slightly more interdisciplinary, what's your expectation of a nature paper. So I think it's partly drawn from your own experiences of what do you expect to see in those kind of journals. So for example, something might be a fantastic GCA paper, but not necessarily perfect for EPSL because it's not quite as targeted at isotope geochemists measuring a certain isotope system. And it's going to be a really well cited paper, but it doesn't really directly have broader implications to earth scientists. And then it's not a step forward in our understanding of the world to be a supposedly to be a you know nature paper or something. So I think having that awareness of who's going to read a paper, who's it most useful for is, is useful when you're reviewing it to ensure that you're, you're sort of targeting it correctly. And the only thing I'd say for reviewing for sort of high profile journals, if you like, is that a paper may be a great paper, but that doesn't mean, and you can say that, and you can say this would be perfect in EPSL or something, but you might comment on the fact that it's not novel and not new, and therefore may not be suitable for that kind of higher profile format. Um, so it's not a criticism. Often if papers are rejected from those kind of journals, or you're making comments that suggest maybe I'm not sure if this should be published here. It's not necessarily saying that the science is bad or wrong, but more that it may not be broad enough in reach or um, novel enough. I guess one, yeah, I completely completely agree with with David there. One one thing that I've done with my students who start reviewing um, as they become postdocs, if I have a review of a paper that I did for a journal and it's been accepted, I actually share my review so they get a sense of what the review was for that paper 
So if you have people in your group that review and if they're comfortable doing that, once the paper has been accepted, you know, don't, don't go out and be like, oh, look at this paper that I trashed or something. You know, there's some examples of when you do a review for a certain journal. Well, here's a review I did for EPSL. Um, this is the way that I formatted it. This is about the kind of content that they were looking for. There actually can be a lot of um, peer learning on that, particularly, I mean, postdocs in particular are the best reviewers in, uh, in my experience. They have the most enthusiasm and seem to spend the most time on it. But um, don't be afraid to ask if someone's comfortable to share that because once it's published, the paper's there and you can see how the response to review went. Um, I don't think there's any, any conflict with that. Perhaps don't ask to see stuff that didn't make it. Um, but once those papers are out there, uh, it's a good learning tool as well. Judy, another thing is that very much following on from that is for several journals have um, provide peer review comments and responses now online. So some of the slightly more open access flavored journals. So that's another route through which you can see how did the review process go. And sometimes it's quite interesting when you see a paper to see what the reviewers commented on, what they thought was strengths, why they thought it was important, what the authors had to do some more work on. So I think that's something that you didn't have really 10 years ago that now may really help people with both sides of the review process. It's it's absolutely fascinating. I went down the rabbit hole once reading all the reviews to <laughs> in the papers. It's it's actually quite a good supplement to some papers to see what was thought originally and you see the progression of thought um, into what was actually published. That's a that's a really good point, David. It's a it's a great way to gauge what other reviews look like. I've actually learned a lot from this when I was starting to do the review, for example, Copernicus um, journals, they have all of their kind of uh, peer review, um, the responses, the reviewers comments, the responses to reviewers are published online. And that was really, really useful as kind of I was learning and, and actually first time as I was writing my own response letter, that was also very useful to like kind of learn how to structure these things. Um, I was just going to add that in some cases you may be asked how to review kind of specifically, in some cases you may not. It might also be the case that you are asked to comment um, in the, the email you uh, receive from an editor asking for a review, you might be asked to, to comment on specific parts of the manuscript or comment on previous reviews. So kind of don't just um, ignore the, the, the email from the editor saying, yeah, I'll accept the review and I'll go and you know review the manuscript. And then actually, if you were to scroll down, the editor is asking you to kind of specifically comment on what the reviewer, one reviewer, two said, and then kind of help 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 the editor make a decision. So that might also be a case that you can, you can have given this more specific instructions as a reviewer. Okay, thank you. Um, so for the, we're going to be a bit more specific about the author response to peer review now for the last 10 or 15 minutes. Um, another broad one to start, how do you go about starting to revise a paper after you've had your your reviews? I think Julie was the longest ago person that I picked on, so Julie. <laughs> How do I start? Um, mm. It depends on the format you got the got the review in, really. If it's a nice review that clearly delineates what you need to do, then it's very straightforward. Um, if you get, okay, so there's two scenarios. If you get a review that says, okay, I want minor, moderate corrections, maybe it's a revision with a resubmission, anything that you've got another shot at, that's great. Prioritize. Because in, in, that, in that editor letter, you'll get what should happen. It'll say, hey, thank you. We've got our, all our reviews now. We might accept your paper if you've done this, this, and that. The most important thing is you have to address everything, and you have to prioritize how the editor has directed you to prioritize. OK? So if you do everything really well, but then the major point that everyone had a, a problem with, you're kind of like, yeah, but it's OK. You know help the editor say yes. And the way that you can help the editor say yes is you, you directly head on address what's been said. It doesn't mean you have to change everything to what the reviewers want, but if you don't, you really need to justify it, okay? So pick the battles. Don't fight over things that don't matter. If it's like a difference of opinion that you're like, oh, but I kind of like it like that, go with what the reviewer says if it's, if it's a small thing. Don't don't fight battles that aren't worth fighting. Save them for the ones that you feel really strongly about. Okay, and um, it it's a huge hurdle 
if we get a revision back and the authors have chosen not to um, implement some of the suggestions with little explanation for why that is, that, that sends a, a real red flag. So if you get, a, get your reviews back, have a look at the scope of them. How long is this gonna take me? Where's the biggest issue? Editorial things you can change, just change them. Even if you know if you don't agree with the spelling of the word, but they like it and the editor likes it, go with it. If, you, if they tell you to say isotopic composition instead of isotope composition, just go with it. You know, it's not, the world isn't gonna end. Prioritize the, the important points that have been raised. There'll usually be one or two things the editor will say, look, you need to address this. Uh, either you haven't given enough information, we don't believe your interpretation, we don't think your figure shows the trend you, says it, you say it does. Um, pick the battles, address everything, but pick the battles that you choose to fight. Anyone else with uh, anything further to say on that? Uh, we do have a couple of specific questions about how how to deal with highly critical reviews. For example, if the hypothesis is is different than the existing narrative, and how do you tell a reviewer that you think they're wrong? So this kind of like choosing the hill to fight on. Um, I was I just add a couple of quick points. Yeah, and so it was Julie's points are great there. Um, so I was only going to mention two other things, one of which is, I, I think, don't write like a 30 page response to reviewers, and then implement barely nothing in the text. Like, it's, it's no harm in the response to reviewers being detailed as such. But th I've seen a few times where it's like that way around. And it's like, you know, a page about why you're not going to do something, and then a page on the next comment about why you're not going to do something. And if it's not affected in any way in the main manuscript, then it's kind of a bit of a waste of everyone's time. So it's useful, even if it only makes us, even if you only make a small change in the manuscript, something that reflects there are other views on the topic, if it's about interpretation or um, acknowledging that some bits are less certain than you previously suggested. Like even a reviewer's comments that you may not completely agree with are useful and they're a reflection of how some reader is going to read your paper. So I think my main tip there really is to make sure that you, as Julie says, don't ignore any of them, but also act upon them and make improvements, use it as a chance to make improvements to the manuscript rather than just having like a 50 page discussion with the editor and the reviewers. So I think that's one thing that can help people and just generally be really specific with this is what we've changed uh, here at this point in the manuscript for each um, comment that's made. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would I would say as, as a general point, r remember that when you resubmit your paper, it's more than likely going back to the same reviewers for another look. So if you're ignoring what they're saying, it's not likely that you're going to get a better answer than you did the first time around. Journals are perfectly fine with rebuttal. They're very happy for you to justify why you're not making a change. But as Julie said, you got to tell them why you're not making the change. So you got to deal with all the points. Um, a nice manuscript, which has got color to show where you've changed stuff, because of course the line numbers have all changed when you took out that paragraph at the start. So, so the original line numbers that you were talking about, they're all changed. So you've really got to help the reviewers and the editors to locate the stuff that you've, you've fixed. Yeah, on, on that point, you can use the actual reviews. So what I do in responding to reviews is I have a summary paragraph, just like if you do a review, saying, thank you very much for the time taken to, to look at this, this manuscript. Um, I've addressed the major points here, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll cut and paste the actual review and then answer point yeah. by points and do not delete any of that review, even if it's not a point. Okay, so it really helps. I can't tell you how much that helps the editor because they can compare the whole thing. They say, okay, so they've addressed every single point. They've focused on these major issues. They've redone this figure. I can go look at that figure. Okay, I agree. They were right. The reviewer was less right. Just anything to help the editor navigate what you've changed. You'll usually submit a track change version and a clean version. But what really helps us literally is that cut and paste text from reviewers and your point by point response directly underneath their comments, referring to where it is in, in the track changes or in the clean version. Um, don't don't um, anything that that saves us time in finding your changes and understanding um, that they've been done and they've been done to a good standard. But you don't also have to, like David said, go go crazy with the text. If you've changed something underneath it, just go done. You know, you don't have to say, I have changed this now. Now I hope it is okay. No, 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 just say done. It's fine. <laughs> We're fine with that.
Okay, anyone else with any other um, any other suggestions there? And how to make life easier for editors as well? Maybe you could put your comments in a different color. As Julie was saying, if you have these paragraphs, if you put your comments, you know, kind of your responses always in blue, for example, that is extremely helpful because otherwise it just ends up being block by block and, you know, that's harder to read. Great point, yeah. great point. Yes, the colors are very, very good. This seems to be something that's come up in both sides of things is um, consider how it would be to receive that document, regardless of what side you are currently on, the writer, the author or the reviewer or the editor, just think about what it's what it's going to be to, to receive that um, and make it as easy as possible. Um, OK, so sometimes uh, different reviewers might have opposing recommendations. Um, how how do you deal with that? I guess it depends a bit where you where you, if you feel you sit on one if they have two really different views maybe on how to interpret a data set whether you feel you sit on one side or the other. I think if you feel like one of them has really got it and you're, you you agree with them, you can sort of follow their all their suggestions and then use some of their arguments to rebuttal in it you know in a polite and sensible way. Say look. You know, this other review has made these points, but that isn't commonly what's accepted. And, you know, so we're, we're following reviewer two, not reviewer one is one thing that you can sometimes is sometimes useful, but also maybe try and reflect that may not be the case. They may both have valid points and it may be that you can reflect both of their ideas in the paper, make the paper a bit more interesting or a bit more open and, and say, like, actually, there's these different possible interpretations. I suspect this is more when it comes to fundamental like, interpretations and things than the data, because the data sort of has to be sorted and fixed and one of them is probably right or wrong um, but if it's about you know how you're interpreting your data then I think it's fine that there are these different views out there and you should reflect them to some extent but you probably want to come down on the side that you most agree with yourself. That, that's a really good point there you look at your reviews don't look at them in isolation like reviewer one reviewer two reviewer three it it actually is really helpful if a if an author says well reviewer one said this, reviewer two said this, we think we're closer to here, blah, 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 because you're then making the link um, for, for the editor to help them understand the context for maybe one of the comments of a reviewer that hasn't given the context. Like reviewer three said that this wasn't right because of blah, 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 but they failed to notice this, this, this as pointed out by reviewer two. And, and making those links really strengthens your arguments when you use the reviews um, to help you. I, I saw a paper last week which had um reject major revision and minor revision as the three verdicts from the, the reviewers. So, so from an editorial point of view, you, you seek another review at that stage because it's really difficult if you're if you're an editor without specific expertise to make a judgment call on that. Yeah, that must make life hard. It's pretty unusual to be fair. <laughs> sure. Um, Okay, so we always end these panels with a top tip question. So um, what is your top tip for responding to peer review? Or in, in, uh, in reviewing, you can take either side of uh, the fence in that, um, but your top tip. Uh, let's start with Kevin. Uh, top tip for reviewing, I think, and I say this from an editorial perspective, is give as much detail as possible. Give, give as much as you can, as much as your time allows to the review process and to the authors, because when the time comes, that will be you looking for as much advice and as much information and input as you possibly can to make your work the best it can be. Great. Uh, Julie? I guess the main theme that I'd go with is write your reviews and write your responses as if you were to receive them. Um, no matter what, whether you agree or disagree, you're going to get a better response from both of those perspectives if you do constructive criticism and constructive praise as well. Don't forget the positives. Hannah? Ooh, hard to say something that, that wasn't said already. I guess, um, yeah, professional, respectful, maybe, maybe just to yeah, throw something um, different in. Um, 
kind of any comments that that you're given as a reviewer or potentially actually when you're responding as a, as an author um yeah just try use use evidence based on evidence justify justify whatever you're saying and why you're saying that david what's, what's left um yes i I, <laughs> I think um i would say sort of two things one of which is just I would always take, from an author's point of view, I would always try and take something from all reviews, even if they're critical, even if they're, even if you think their tone in a few a few instances wasn't quite right. I, I still look back on papers that had those, even where I've incorporated, you know, comments from those and thought that they're so much better for those comments, even while disagreeing quite strongly with aspects of the comments. So I think try and just take the positive small reviews and use them because they are super, super valuable. Um, and then from the other side, the counterpart to that is it's, it's it's really I mean it's really rewarding and interesting reviewing, although it's a big commitment. But think of it as a way in which you're influencing like the science, influencing the field, making better papers for your colleagues to read, even sometimes drawing attention to an author of a link they've missed or a new study that they've not been able to follow up on. So I think it's actually I would almost view it from both sides as being part of the scientific process. It's not like you've done the science and then you want to get it published. It's it, it's a huge help to improving your work and other people's work um, so if you just view it as part of the process and yeah it's tough sometimes but just um it strengthens things so much so view it as that and not as this final hoop okay i think that's a great note to to end on is that peer review is part of a community thing and trying to approach things with professionalism and and detail but empathy of the the other person i think that's very nice um, so we're going to call it there. I did just hear my local bells chiming two o'clock. So um, I want to thank my the panel for, for joining us today. Hannah, David, Julie, Kevin, like great. Thank you very much for um, giving us your insights and, and some advice. And thanks as well to everyone who came and watched us and the people who submitted questions ahead of time. It's really appreciated. Um, keep an eye on Twitter and our website, geochemistry.group to find out when the next one of these is. Um, but till then, yeah, thanks again, everybody. And um, have a great afternoon. Bye. Thanks, Sophie.